Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here on one more session of our Quantum Research Center seminar. And today I have the pleasure of having here Professor Derek Chang from the Photonic Institute of Sciences in Barcelona, ICFO. Um, I have the pleasure of knowing Derek for quite some years already. Um, we collaborated in the past. I, was, I had that privilege. And uh, Derek had, um, it's, it's okay, so let's, let's make it short. He's, um, you know, he has done many contributions, many things to the field, but I will try to be, to be short with the introduction. So he's an ICREA re research professor at the Institute of Photonic Sciences in Barcelona, and he's the leader of the theoretical quantum nanophotonic groups since 2011. Um, he got his bachelor's and PhD degrees in Stanford and Harvard, and then he was a postdoc in Caltech under the group of Jeff Kimball, if I understand correctly, right? Um, so he's really an authority on the field, and he has been recognized with several awards, including two uh, European Research Council grants. So it's really a big, big pleasure to have you here today, Derek. Um, and, and yeah, please go ahead, proceed with your talk. Thank you again. Okay. Um, well, first, uh, thanks to, to Leandro for, for the invitation to, uh, to give this talk today. Um, it's also a pleasure to, to give a talk to uh, this new institute, um, even if it's only uh, virtually. Um, let me try to share the screen. I should also say, um, if anyone has questions, just feel free to, to jump in and, and, and interrupt. I, you know, I, I prefer to keep this at a kind of more informal level. OK, so. Um, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can, oh. we can see your screen and your mouse. Move, move your mouse. I oh, know you're still not in presentation. Yeah, we can see everything. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. All right. Um, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about a topic that has um, interested interest me quite a bit in recent years, um, which is using ordered arrays of atoms to do quantum optics and quantum information processing. Um, so, you know, the field of, of quantum optics or, or kind of, you know, quantum atom light interfaces is, is huge these days, both kind of theoretically and, and experimentally. Um, and that's because, you know, the, the ability to interface atoms and light in a quantum coherent way, um, you know, opens up a lot of, uh, you know, technological possibilities. Um, for example, things like quantum memories for light. Uh, you know, photon photon gates, where you know if two photons collide, they can effectively interact and impart a pi phase shift to each other. Um, these types of interactions can also be used to uh, generate interesting uh, metrological useful states, like spin squeezed states. Um, in this case, what you can do is you can you know uh, uh, map collective spin properties of the atoms onto light, and then by measuring the light you know exquisitely, you can basically kind of project down the noise of the collective atomic spin in, in some quadrature. Um, and then there's also the possibility for just kind of rich many body physics, you know, for example, realizing rich kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, many body quantum states of light that don't really kind of, you know, normally exist in, in real life. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, so these are just a few of the, you know, potentially many applications of atom light interfaces. And I think that overall, it's fair to say that, you know, many of these uh, we can pull off in the lab, but probably not to the degree and fidelity that we want to. And, you know, the underlying challenge or one of the big bottlenecks in all of this is simply that, you know, it's hard to make the basic building blocks of atom light interfaces, you know, that is a single photon and a single atom interact uh, with each other efficiently. Um, and so in, in atomic physics and quantum optics, you know, that can be illustrated with, with one pretty well-known result. So imagine that you just take a kind of single isolated atom, and then uh, this atom has, a, has an optical transition between some ground and excited state. Um, and then you imagine, you know, taking a, 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 a laser beam and you focus it down to some area A. And the, resonant, the, 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 the laser is chosen so that its frequency is resonant with the atomic transition. Um, so in that case, it's pretty well known that, you know, the scattering probability of a single photon uh, uh, to, you know, scatter or interact with the single atom is given by some effective scattering cross-section on resonance divided by the beam area. 
And what's kind of remarkable about this result is that the scattering cross section is just given by uh, the resonant wavelength of the transition itself. So it doesn't really depend on any microscopic details of the atom. The problem though is that if you try to do this, do this experiment in free space, um, you have to obey the diffraction limit. So you can't just take a beam of light and focus arbitrarily tightly. And so, you know, instead of the other experiments, if you put in all the kind of coefficients and technicalities, um, the record kind of interaction probability that you get in this type of experiment is about 10%, okay? So, so that's not bad, but, you know, what we want is some, as close to 100% as possible. Um, so that's a well-known problem in, in quantum optics, and there's well-known kind of solutions or approaches. And one of them is just simply to use a lot of atoms or the notion of collective enhancement. So if I have you know, n atoms, then you know, if I just kind of extend the previous argument, then my interaction probability should get enhanced by the atom number. And in atomic physics, this kind of composite quantity here is known as the optical depth of my atomic medium. So it's an important figure of merit. Um, to understand why it's so important, uh, one can actually take a kind of complementary viewpoint and think about you know, the branching ratio of, of, of emission or information into some preferred optical mode versus into four pi. So in particular, imagine that I, I have a collection of atoms and I create a, a collective excitation. So just one atom is excited, but it's a, it's, a, it's a coherent superposition where each atom has some relative phase or each, where each excitation has some relative phase e to the i k r. So what happens then is that, you know, this uh, system acts a little bit like a kind of phased array, a uh, phased antenna array. So in some direction, in particular, in the direction that's set by the wave vector of, of this collective excitation, um, all the emission of light will interfere constructively. And then the emission rate into this one preferred direction, so this could be something like a kind of Gaussian mode that you defined, um, will be n times that uh, of, of just a single atom. Um, on the other hand, you know, uh, the atoms can still emit into 4 pi, but because I don't have this kind of constructive interference, that emission rate, gamma naught, is going to be the same as a single isolated atom. So the emission into the good direction gets enhanced, but the emission in the bad directions stays the same. And so one can show that this optical depth also has the meaning of this branching ratio of good to bad emission. It's exactly n times uh, gamma 1d, the emission into my kind of good preferred mode, over the emission into other directions. And so if you think of this as now a branching ratio of information, how much light, how much information can you collect from the atoms by looking at light in this direction versus how much you lose, then it kind of makes sense that this optical depth should impose fundamental limits on the errors of any you know, in, uh, in application uh, associated with uh, with quantum information processing. Eric, one question. And the preferred channel is always defined by the by the propagation mode of the incoming photon, right? Or does it um, also have to do with practice, some cavity yeah. or okay? In practice, right. Okay. Uh, I mean, I guess you can do you can consider more general cases, but yeah, typically what you do is you send in light, and then you know that light might be in some Gaussian mode that you created in your lab. And then, you know, even without atoms, once you know you've created that Gaussian mode, you can design the optics on the other side to collect efficiently, you know, to get as close to 100% collection as possible. So that then defines the kind of one dimensional or quasi one dimensional mode that you're talking to. Cool. cool. Thanks. Great. Um, so, uh, just as kind of one example of how this, this optical depth uh, shows up. Uh, let me uh, bring up one particular example of a quantum application, which is a quantum memory for light. So what a quantum memory for light is, is you, know, you imagine how you have some kind of uh, coherent wave function of light. This could be, for example, a single qubit of light encoded in a uh, polarization degree of freedom. And you know, what you would like to do is you would like to take that kind of flying photon and coherently and reversibly convert it into some collective atomic excitation or some kind of uh, stationary you know, qubit for a long time, and ideally be able to reverse this process later to retrieve the information in your quantum hard drive. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can actually implement this type of quantum memory in the lab. Um, but then in 2007, there's this really elegant uh, theory analysis 
which concluded that you know, no matter what approach you take in the lab, when you really optimize it, you're going to get the identical or same maximum efficiency in the end, which only depends on the optical depth of the medium. And what they showed more particularly is that this error, uh, which is one minus the efficiency or the probability that you lose a photon, that's given asymptotically by 5.8 divided by optical depth. Um, so uh, let's kind of now just look at what that looks like in a real experiment. So this is a state-of-the-art experiment on uh, a quantum memory for, for photon qubits uh, from Julian Lorat's group in Paris. So what they're kind of uh, plotting here uh, is experimentally the efficiency that they see as a function of optical depth. Can I ask a question? Sure. Yes, excuse me, just about this error. Uh, so uh, it seems very reasonable that basically should this solely depend on D, right? But right. uh, on what else could it uh, could it depend? On what else or, or, or on what other variables you can you can ever depend on? So I mean, in, in principle. So, so that's the beautiful thing about this result. Like um, ideally, it depends on nothing else. So that doesn't include kind of technical errors. For example, if if your you know so you you generate a Gaussian beam on the input, and if your output is just terribly mode matched, you know it doesn't account for that. But that's just a kind of you know that's kind of experimentally your problem, right? It doesn't account for kind of more technical problems as well. Um, for example, if you just have huge dephasing that comes from you know magnetic field noise that you can't control. But you know, essentially, yeah, as long as you can kind of reduce those kind of technical uh, sources of noise, uh, you should be able to saturate this bound. Okay. And you know, maybe uh, I guess you know I can kind of explain more of this mm -hmm. plot, and yes, you know, maybe that will answer your, your question. Yeah. Um, so so basically, what you see here is that as they increase the optical depth, so you know, increasing optical depth is just you know putting in more and more atoms. Um, they do see an increase in the efficiency or the, the you know, efficiency is basically one minus error. And then, um, you know, it's not like number of atoms is a limited resource, so they can even put in more and more atoms, but then they actually see that the efficiency starts to go down again. Okay, so the problem is basically that, you know, in real life, this fundamental error uh, shrinks too slowly as a function of D. And then as you increase D even further, um, the error doesn't keep on getting better, but then it actually gets worse again. And so basically what that means is that, you know, again, in real life, it's not a problem to have a huge number of atoms, but it's very hard to make that huge number of atoms fully functional. Um, so that usually in, introduces, you know, other kind of technical problems. In this specific experiment, the actual technical problem is that um, in, this, uh, in this analysis here, they assume the minimal model of an atom, which is like a three level atom. That's the kind of uh, protocol that you need, for example, to implement an EIT based quantum memory. So in this case, the technical problem that they have when they have a huge number of atoms is that their real atom is not a three level atom. It's a, it's a huge kind of multi-level structure. And even though you know, a lot of those kind of levels and transitions are far away from resonance, you know, when you have so many atoms, those far off resonant transitions actually start to play a role again. Um, so that's kind of one particular example of, you know, why you might not saturate uh, this error, especially for huge atom numbers. Okay. So in this case, they got to about 30% error, and I think these days it's a little bit better, maybe around 15%. But, you know, this kind of plot here, which is actually pretty representative for, for a lot of other applications as well, you know, kind of shows that there's no obvious way of how you can kind of, you know, make the situation better to get to the 1% or less uh, level of errors. Okay. Um, uh, can, so can so that's the kind of question. Uh, yes. uh, one other question. Um, uh -huh. um, concerning, uh, it's because I um, came to the seminar a bit uh, later. Um, uh, can you please explain to me again uh, what the optical depth is? It will be some sort of um, uh, absorption probability or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so optical depth is um, so if you have just one atom interacting with light, um, the interaction probability is given by so with with resonant light, then the interaction probability is given by uh, you know basically the scattering cross section of a single atom divided by your focal area of the beam, okay. and then when you have many atoms, 
then your uh, uh, then your interaction probability is basically n times that, and, and that's basically the the, the definition okay. of, of probable. Okay. Thank you. So it says the figure of merit of how efficient you expect your Abbott light interface to be. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so uh, that was a question you know uh, I got curious about a few years ago. Is there any way to to beat that limit? Um, and it turns out there is, and um, you know, the starting point for that realization is to realize that this kind of picture that I illustrated for you about the meaning of optical depth can't really be the, the, the complete answer, okay? And so in particular, um, you know, what you can do is even at a classical level, you can just simulate some kind of classical coupled dipoles. And uh, when you do that type of simulation, you know, so here you just put in, you know, 10,000, 100,000, you know, discrete classical dipoles. And then when they start radiating, you do see this kind of uh, enhanced emission in the forward direction. So that's this kind of collective enhancement that everyone knows about in, in quantum optics. But then when you look at the bad emission, so the, the light that you're losing in the four pi, you see that there's actually some interesting structure in there, right? It's not some just completely uniform emission. And that structure of electromagnetic radiation into all the other directions is basically the product of wave interference and multiple scattering of light. Um, so, you know, if you believe, so, you know, I think classically it's quite plausible to believe that when you have random atoms, you, know, you can kind of phase emission in one direction, but then in the other directions, the emission is kind of complicated. But then essentially by conservation of energy, if the emission of energy uh, into four pi has this kind of interesting structure that depends on wave interference. From the standpoint of the atoms themselves, that means the spontaneous emission can't be independent like what I've illustrated here, but fundamentally must be correlated. Okay? So this atom does not know how at what rate it should emit energy until it knows about what all the other atoms are doing in the system. And the point is that uh, that fact is not included in the quantum optics textbooks. Even when I was a graduate student, I never learned about that. And you know, when I read the papers, I never learned that that was some subtlety or, or something that I should be, be careful about. Okay. Um, so it was a really a big surprise to me you know, a few years ago to kind of uh, realize that. Um, and, and so then one might ask, you know, when you read the textbooks, when you learn atom-like interactions, why is it that the emission into other directions is just being, is, why is it just treated as being independent? And so I don't really know the full answer to that, but I think some kind of reasonable guesses are that first, um, it's just hard to treat otherwise. So, you know, having an independent bath just makes your theory analysis much easier. Um, the second thing, which is a little bit more kind of sneaky, is that, you know, usually when we talk about, you know, macroscopic theories of interactions between light and, and a medium, we tend to smooth that medium out, right? So, so the classical analogy is when we talk about glass, we don't talk about 10 to the 23rd atoms, but we just talk about a refractive index, okay? And the point is that once you smooth out the atomic medium, then you intrinsically get rid of all the kind of granularity and the associated wave interference effects. And you know, I think the third, which is kind of just historically motivated by experiments, is that you know, historically, when you talk about atoms, they're dilute and they're kind of moving around. So that tends to wash out these interference effects over time. Okay. Um, but then, yeah, you know, I guess the kind of follow-up question is that you know, given the control over atoms we have these days, in particular, we can just kind of put atoms wherever you want. Uh, can we actually then go and exploit wave interference in protocols? And the particular idea that I want to introduce to you at the kind of big picture level is that now imagine if I start positioning atoms how I want, in particular in some kind of atomic array, then you know, once I start exciting this array, not only will I get the kind of good collective enhancement into my preferred direction that I got in the past, but then I can maybe also at the same time get a kind of destructive interference of emission into four pi, into the bad directions that I can't collect. And if I'm lucky, that, uh, that suppression of emission into four pi might actually be explicitly dependent on the atom number. So as I add more and more atoms, I can make the emission more and more selective into my preferred direction. So now if I think about the kind of branching ratio of information, my good emission rate will go like n times gamma 1d. That's exactly the same result that I showed before. 
But now my band emission could actually get shut off as a function of n. Okay, so now I get this kind of super linear scaling and atom number. And then I can potentially get a much better figure of merit than my optimal depth. Okay. Um, so this is a new concept that we coined selective radiance a few years ago. Um, it's personally, you know, uh, uh, for me, it's personally one of the reasons that I'm very interested in, in the optical properties of, of arrays these days. And I should point out that aside for myself, you know, the, the, this question of optics with arrays is a rapidly growing field. And that actually includes, you know, pioneering work from even more than a decade ago by Helmut Rich and, and Jana Rostakowski. This is this is very interesting, Larry. This is really nice. But let me ask you something that you're you're able to you manage to to distractively interfere all the uh, all the angular modes except for the propagation one. This is really uh, impressive. More or less, right? Yeah. So so right. So I guess the the challenge is actually more to do that in the kind of quantum domain. Mm -hmm. You know. So when you just can't when you can't just necessarily think of your atoms as classical dipoles anymore. Um, I should point out that, you know, within kind of classical uh, optics engineering and sort of microwave engineering and so on, you know, these ideas are, are I think, kind of well, well known. Maybe I they're see. cast in a, in a language that you wouldn't think about it. Mm -hmm. But for example, it's the same physics that people use to design uh, these telescope arrays. Um, and also, you know, even these kind of Yagi, uh, Yagi antennas that you see on top of homes, you know, it, it's kind of the same design principles. I see. I see. And yeah, it's just kind of weird that you know people have known about it and that community exploited it for 50 years. And then somehow atomic physics, you know, just, just then, for weird historical reasons, we came up with a completely different theory that, that ignores this interference. But then the, the no-go result by looking, this was due because they were assuming they were kind of averaging out this the spatial structure of the atom lattice lab, right? That's exactly. So that's, so they like like many like any other textbook, assume that the emission in the four pi was independent. Mm, I see. All right. Mm. Okay. Thanks. Yes, I have also another comment uh, or question. Uh, what might be you can ask also in the question say, later on. Say uh, in all your discussion, basically you are very generic with the kind of atoms you use. But I believe that this uh, answer change. For instance, if you take it. For, say Rydberg, for instance, Rydberg atoms, because you have interaction, right, between uh, between atoms. And then uh, I imagine that actually this uh, rule cannot be applied. Am I correct? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So I, I should specify more. So it is pretty general. Um, and, and Rydberg interactions will actually become a, a part of the story later on. So you can actually use it to functionalize this array and do other things. But um, the, the only thing I assumed or, or the only statement that I've made so far is basically that um, the scattering cross section is lambda squared on resonance. And for that to be true, um, uh, so it, it's not generically true, but um, basically what you need is that um, you need some electronic excited state, which is optically active. And then when it decays, the only path, so there's a, the, the only assumption is that there's a unique pathway by which it can decay and by emitting a photon. So it has, basically has to, in other words, it has to decay to a unique ground state. So if that one excited state were to have the option to decay into 20 different lower states, then uh, uh, then my arguments wouldn't apply. So, so basically what I'm saying is applicable to any atomic transition, which is which basically has a unique pathway downward. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so, so that's a bit of a kind of extended you know, motivation. Um, and then in the rest of the talk, I basically like to kind of cover briefly three things. Um, so the first is, you know, how might one uh, design a quantum theory, a, a tractable quantum theory of, uh, of atom light interactions that includes multiple scattering. Um, and then I'd like to discuss uh, uh, a couple of uh, prominent consequences of that. Um, so the first will just be a kind of linear optical effects, where if you have a 2D array of atoms, then that can act as a perfect mirror for resonant light. Um, so while a mirror is kind of passive, then I'll discuss how you can basically turn that into a more active uh, 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 device, in particular to construct a quantum memory protocol, which utilizes the selective radiance 
to get an error scaling that was better than this kind of PRL paper that I pointed out earlier. Um, and then the next thing I'll discuss is how to take that kind of same 2D array and basically make it highly nonlinear in order to realize a photon photon gate. And in particular, I'll, use, I'll do that by introducing Rydberg interactions into the story. Um, and then if I have time, I'll, I'll just comment a little bit on kind of interesting future directions that, uh, that one might explore. Okay, so let me discuss now the general uh, theory model that, uh, that we've been using. Um, so the basic problem is the following. You have some collection of atoms whose positions could be arbitrary. You send in some light, which could be classical or quantum. Uh, you know, the, the, and the, then the important thing is that the atoms get excited, uh, they could start emitting photons, but those photons could then bounce back and interact with other atoms. And then you'd like to calculate the output field properties at any point in space and time. Um, so it turns out that this part of the problem, calculating uh, or, or you know, writing down the, the correlations in space and time, that turns out to be the kind of formally easy part of the problem. Um, and then just to make the, the discussion specific, um, from now on, I'm going to focus on a minimal model of an atom, which is a two-level atom. So there's an electronic excited state and a ground state. Uh, if I just have a single atom, the excited state will drop down to the ground state by spontaneously emitting a photon at a rate gamma naught. And that transition has some resonance frequency omega eg and some uh, associated uh, resonant wavelength lambda eg. Um, so as I said before, uh, uh, formally it's easy to write down uh, an expression for the total quantum light coming out. So I can exploit a well-known classical result, which is that I can always write my total field as the coherent sum of a field that I send in, plus a field which is rescattered by my point-like elements. Um, and so while that's known, uh, while, while that's well known classically, that turns out to be true also in the quantum domain. For now, that relation just turns into a kind of uh, relation involving quantum operators. Okay, so my total quantum field operator is my input field operator plus my rescattered fields. And in the language of these two level atoms, the rescattered field depends on the atomic coherence, which is kind of like the, the induced dipole moment of the atom. So uh, sigma GE or the atomic lowering operator times this so called electromagnetic Green's function. And this electromagnetic Green's function, uh, in, in, if we just restrict ourselves to free, free space, which is sufficient for this talk, it's really just the kind of spatial pattern uh, of light emitted by a, a radiating or oscillating point dipole. Okay, so it has, you know, in the far field, the kind of famous one over R uh, low radiation pattern, and it has some kind of near field components as well. Okay, so this Green's function just simply describes how a field propagates from your source, which is in this case atom Ri, out to your detection point at some position R. Okay. So what this, this simple formula is pretty powerful because it basically says that if you know your input fields and you know what your atoms are doing, you can construct any field correlation for free. Um, so the challenging part then is actually to figure out what are the atoms doing. So um, if I think about the atoms, then of course the atoms will be driven by the total fields. But then essentially from this equation here, I can express the total field in terms of an input and the field being re-radiated by other atoms. So it turns out that I can derive the atomic dynamics, uh, you know, except from this picture of integrating out the field, um, just from an effective Hamiltonian that only involves the atoms alone. So this effective Hamiltonian has some kind of input or driving term. And then it also has this kind of what looks like a spin-spin interaction. Um, and what this interaction basically says is that you know, if you have one atom J, which is excited, and another atom I, which is in the ground state, they can flip each other's excitations around, fiscally mediated by a propagating photon. And kind of intuitively, the strength of the interaction depends on the Green's function uh, or how light propagates from one atom to another. So this kind of photon allows for these kind of coherent dipole-dipole interactions, um, but also allows for correlated emission. Okay, so um, I can also get dissipative dynamics. And that occurs basically when I have a collection of excited atoms, they can de-excite and emit a photon past the boundaries of my, my atomic system out to infinity. Okay, so I start losing atomic excitations in the process. Um, so the form of this kind of a master equation or density matrix equation doesn't really matter so much here. Um, the only thing that I'll point out though is that this kind of emission is correlated 
it involves a sum over pairs of atoms or pairs of correlations. And that's what encodes the wave interference effects in radiation. Okay, so in contrast, you know, my, my first few slides when I argued kind of textbook quantum optics, there is no coherent sum here. It's just really a sum over independent atoms. So one usually assumes independent emission uh, just by hand. Um, so, so these are the equations that we'll be trying to use uh, to kind of come up with new physics. So uh, these equations themselves, actually, you know, I didn't invent, they have a long history dating back more than, than, than 50 years, okay? even back to, you know, the famous Dickey super radiance paper. Um, but what I think is fair to say is that these equations don't really show up in your normal textbooks. And I think that's historically because these kind of equations are hard to solve, right? So formally what you're trying to solve here is some many body uh, spin model with long range interactions, dissipation and, and out of equilibrium. Okay? And so I think that's why these kind of equations kind of gotten for, were kind of you know, forgotten about, at least as a kind of bona fide starting point to think about atom light interactions. And so you know, while, these, the, while the, the, these equations themselves aren't new, I guess what's new now is maybe that we just have better perspectives about how we can approach this problem. Right, so these ideas like kind of algebraic equilibrium physics, dissipative uh, spin models, they're kind of you know modern frontiers of condensed matter physics. And by taking you know ideas from there and also tools from modern photonics, maybe we can use these equations in new uh, and in insightful ways. Okay, so um, let me just illustrate one example that uh, you can prove from this kind of spin model. And so actually, one nice thing is that you know even though the, the spin model provides the mathematical formalism, you can actually just use a lot of intuition from optics and photonics to, to kind of get at the answer independently. So I'll kind of more follow that second approach here. Okay, so what I want to you know, try and prove or convince you of is that if I have an infinite 2D array of atoms, that can form a perfect mirror for single resonant photons. Um, so to understand that, you basically need four ingredients. Um, the first is um, you need to realize that, you know, these kind of isolated atoms, they cannot absorb light, okay? So they have no internal degrees of freedom to just eat a photon and make it convert into some other, you know, form of energy. Um, that photon has to scatter, okay? Um, the second thing is that because of the spatial order, the scattering can't occur into random directions, but it can only occur in discrete diffraction orders, okay? So as an example, if, if I shine in light just at normal incidence, then the fundamental diffraction order is that I can go straight back up or straight down. And then the first diffraction order is that, you know, the, the, my 2D array can add a discrete unit of momentum in the plane. So basically one reciprocal lattice vector, and that will cause the light to scatter off at well, to some well-defined angle. The third result is that if the lattice constant is sub-wavelength, then actually only the fundamental mode survives. So basically, if the lattice constant D becomes too small, then this uh, in-plane momentum component becomes too large, and it becomes larger than the momentum of, of light itself. Okay, so, so basically, this cannot be a, be a radiated photon. And then the fourth thing you need is actually just to realize that atoms have, have a resonance. Okay. Um, so I think because I started a bit late, maybe I'll just skip the argument a little bit. But the qualitative idea is that, um, you know, because I have a resonance, or another way of thinking of it is that if I have a lattice constant, um, which is smaller than actually the scattering cross, than the scattering cross section of the atoms themselves, then something significant has to happen when I shine in light on resonance. And it turns out that significant thing is basically 100% uh, reflection. Um, and so this has actually been experimentally observed um, in Emmanuel Bloch's group last year. So in this case, they can create a nearly defect-free 2D array of atoms. Um, in this case, through a quantum gas microscope by basically creating a 2D mod insulating phase. And then, you know, basically they send in light and then directly in the imaging system, they can see this kind of uh, spotlight uh, light up exactly where their mod insulating state is sitting. Um, and so in their case, they see about 60% reflectance. And actually the reason they don't see you know, much closer to 100% isn't really any kind of you know, fundamental reason. It's more to the lowest order that their experiment just wasn't designed to do quantum optics. So their collection optics isn't really ideal. And then you know, their experiments are quite slow. So they have to send in too many photons. 
which causes the atoms to heat up and for them to lose photons and for them to lose atoms and lose this kind of perfect ordering. Okay. All right. So, um, so that's kind of interesting. You know, you can get a hundred percent reflection. And so again, you know, if I just want a mirror, I can just go buy one at the store. But then you can ask kind of more deeply. You know, does a hundred percent reflection maybe mean that I achieved a one hundred percent atom photon interaction efficiency? And it turns out the answer is yes. But before we get too excited, we should be careful a little bit because even in our in our kind of textbook models, if I have an infinite array or an infinite atom number, that implies I can have infinite optical depth. So then I also get kind of hundred percent fidelity, at least theoretically. So what we really need to do is consider, you know, how it scales with atom number, you know, so basically having finite resources. And then, uh, then we have to kind of basically define what it means in a, in a real lab, you know, what does efficiency, you know, even mean. Okay, so again, imagine I have a kind of n by n array that I can create in the lab. And again, one thing that's easy to do is create an incoming Gaussian beam. So I can easily have collection optics you know, and, uh, and excitation optics to create a Gaussian beam with some beam waste W. And then once I've set up that collection optics, I can easily collect any reflected light back into that same uh, single mode. And I'll go, I can also align any optics to you know, detect any light that's transmitted into that same Gaussian mode. Okay. Um, so those modes I can maybe kind of uh, you know, excite and collect efficiently, but then I have kind of have to naturally assume that you know, even though I do have in principle light scattering off in the other direction in the four pi, any other light that doesn't go into this Gaussian, you know, in the transmitted reflected directions is lost. Okay. So that's how I define reflectance, transmission, and, and loss. And so you can basically, you know, analyze what the kind of maximum reflectance is for a finite size array as a function of beam waste. And kind of intuitively, it's not going to be exactly 100% because of two competing effects. So if my beam waste is too big, then part of the kind of incoming uh, uh, light just kind of bypasses the array completely. And then if my beam waste is too small, you know, if I just kind of focus on one or two atoms, then kind of intuitively I have to lose all the kind of collective enhancement and interference effects. Okay? But then you can kind of now optimize over the beam waste. And then what you find is that, you know, even for relatively small systems, you can get very close to 100% reflection where the error basically grows like one over n to the four, where n is the linear number of atoms in the array. Okay. So you reach, you, you scale up to 100% very fast as a function of atom number. Um, so the next thing that you can do is, um, okay, instead of reflection, again, now let's think of a particular application. And let's go back to this kind of quantum memory for light. So, you know, imagine I send in a single photon, uh, how efficiently can I convert it into a single collective excitation of the atoms? Okay. Um, so in the quantum memory protocol, basically you start from the same 2D array. Um, and then the first thing that you have to do is you have to take that single photon and uh, set it on a beam splitter, and then split that photon and send the photon in from both directions at the same time. And the reason that kind of makes sense is, you know, if you, if you think about the time reverse process, if you think about this array emitting a photon, essentially by the mirror symmetry of the system, the array naturally talks to light, you know, symmetrically in both directions. Okay, so you have to kind of, you know, play the reverse video to get, you know, something close to 100% efficiency. So, you know, this photon that I send in, that will be resonant on the G to E transition. And you know, maybe technically that's kind of a quantum memory already. So maybe your atoms would coherently get excited and you would create a single E state. But then because this uh, excited state can spontaneously emit you know, at a very fast rate, essentially you, know, you would send in the photon, you kind of store it for a short time, and then you, you know, the, the, your quantum memory would just spit out the photon immediately right after. And it's not at a time that you can control. So one way you can fix that is you can introduce another uh, 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 even higher lying state. So this could be a Rydberg state in practice. Uh, these Rydberg states can be very long lived. And then what you can do is you can just simply take a classical control field. And then, you know, at the same time that this photon, you know, want to create an excitation E, you can basically do a Raman transition and siphon or, or, or shelf that population now into this Rydberg excitation. So now you finally you know, have effectively stored that photon in a state that lives for a very long time. Um, so at the end of this process, you've converted this incoming photon 
into a superposition state where one atom within the uh, within the focal area of the beam is now in a in a Rydberg excitation. Um, so it turns out that the quantum memory has exactly the same uh, error sources as reflection. So you, you basically you can't make the beam waves too big so that it stretches beyond your array, nor can you make the beam waves so small that you're only focusing onto one or two atoms uh, at, at a time. Okay. Um, so basically, the point is that you know, when you optimize that, you get an error that scales like one over n to the four. Okay, so that's a much better scaling than this one over uh, optical depth that I described before. And even aside from just kind of abstract scalings, you can even just analyze more quantitatively. Yeah, you know, what if I what if I have a typical two D array? What is the error that I pick up as a function of linear atom number? Um, so that's this kind of blue curve here as a function of n. And again, what's kind of remarkable is that just for a five by five array, in principle, you're already at less than 1% error. Okay, so it's a very, very fast drop of drop off of error as a function of increasing array size. Um, so this is a pretty steep polynomial improvement over what uh, you know, uh, you know, what we knew was theoretically possible before. I should say this kind of polynomial improvement in scaling isn't even fundamental. So if you play some kind of tricks, which I won't really go into today. Um, so if you just go to a 1D array coupled to an optical fiber, you can actually find an exponentially better scaling uh, than, than what you know, people thought was possible. Okay, so um, that's a kind of huge gain apparently for, for single photon applications. Um, and then I guess the next question is, you know, what do we try to broaden the class of applications where we, where we, we might win? Okay, so a quantum memory is really just a kind of single photon or linear optical effects. But maybe the next thing we might try is to, uh, to create a strong photon-photon interaction. Uh, for example, to, to build a photon-photon gate. Um, so then the question is basically, can we make the mirror nonlinear at the single photon level? And you know, it's not obvious that that's possible to do. Okay, so in particular, imagine I have this 2D array, this finite size system. I shine in light, and imagine I get one photon detected in reflection. Okay. Um, so if I if I had one photon that was reflected, that implies that some atom in this array had to have been in, had to have been excited. And because that atom is a two-level system. I know that I can't excite it twice, so that one atom can't reflect a second photon exactly at the same time. And so you can view this kind of you know, detection of a reflected photon as punching a single hole or a single defect in your atomic mirror. Okay, so your mirror now has a little defect, it's slightly less reflecting than it was before, but it's really just a small effect. And that's because you know, it's a one atom hole, but then your beam waste potentially covers many atoms. So if I want to create an efficient photon-photon gate within this kind of paradigm, what I need to do is, you know, when I reflect a photon, I want that photon to somehow punch a many atom hole in my atomic mirror. And, and that's basically where, where Rydberg interactions come in. So um, I, again, I kind of a little bit rushed for time, so I'll go through this quickly. Um, so it turns out that, you know, combining Rydberg interactions with atomic ensembles is already a, a thing that's really well studied these days to achieve photon-photon interactions. Okay. Um, and in this case, um, when you have just a kind of disordered ensemble, there, have been, there has been a proposed photon-photon gate where the error scales like a so-called optical depth per blockade radius, one over optical depth per blockade radius to the three halves power. And the point is in state-of-the-art experiments, this parameter, this bigger amount is about 50%. So the question is, can you somehow use arrays to beat the scaling and get you know, an error that's much better than, than 50%, okay? by essentially using this kind of selective radiance? Um, so again, I'm basically falling uh, short on time. So let me just kind of briefly explain the main idea. Um, so the thing about a Rydberg excitation, so a Rydberg uh, excitation is basically an excited atom, but in a very high lying principal quantum number. So in that case, the, this you know, high-lying electron basically has a very large dipole moment. And what that means is that if I have one Rydberg excitation through a essentially strong so-called van der Waals interaction, another Rydberg atom, a Rydberg state, some distance d away, can see a very large energy shift in its resonance frequency. And so that, that energy shift tends to go like you know, some coefficient c6, 
divided by distance to the sixth power. Um, so this is just a pure Rydberg interaction. But then to kind of use that for optics, what we can do is something called Rydberg resting. So instead of a, just a pure Rydberg excitation, I consider kind of an E and R. Uh, so E is just my kind of normal atomic excited state as before. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to shine in a big control field, but which is also very, very far detuned from this E to R transition. Um, so imagine that I have one atom at the origin, which is in the Rydberg state. And now if I have another atom that's very, very far away, then essentially this Rydberg excitation shouldn't even do anything. Okay? So then this, X, this atom here in state E simply sees a very far detuned control field. And that introduces a well-known effect called an AC Stark shift. It basically just kind of renormalizes or shifts the energy of this E state by some amount omega squared over delta. But now if I think about an atom that's, uh, that's much closer to this Rydberg, then essentially this Rydberg excitation shifts this Rydberg level of this atom off by a very far amount. And what that does is it essentially shuts off the AC Stark shift for an atom that's sufficiently close. Okay, so, so now let's think about how I can finally use that for optics. So this is the same plot as before, but now where the shift of the excited state level is just kind of on an exaggerated scale. Okay. So again, let's imagine that I have a Rydberg excitation here at the origin, but now this atom here is in the ground state. Okay. And so what I can do is, you know, I then you know, when an atom is far away, I see this, this state E is shifted by some AC Stark shift, but that's fine, I know what it is. So I can send in light that's resonant with this shifted G to E transition. Okay. But on the other hand, if I take that same light that, of the same frequency, and it, you know, I, that light interacts with an atom that's much closer to this Rydberg excitation, then this E level all of a sudden doesn't have a shift. So it's basically like atoms far away are resonant and they interact efficiently with the light, but atoms that are close to this Rydberg excitation essentially don't interact at all. They become invisible or effectively I punch the hole in my atomic system. Um, so, you know, basically to realize the photon-photon gate, uh, basically we have uh, two photons or two single photon wave packets. So the first pulse I'll call A, which can either be a zero or one photon. And basically like before, I just want to do a quantum memory. I want to store it as a Rydberg excitation. Okay. So if pulse A has zero photons, then when I do the storage, nothing happens. All my atoms stay in state G. But then if I had a photon in, in pulse A, then I stored that excitation into some collective Rydberg excitation somewhere within this beam uh, area. And now the next thing that I'll do is I'll turn on this Rydberg dressing. Okay, so basically any atom that's sufficiently close within a so-called blockade radius of this Rydberg excitation now effectively she sees these kind of energy levels shifted really off resonance and they effectively become transparent to any subsequent light. So I basically now punch a big hole in my atomic array. And then finally I send in the second photon. Okay, so if, uh, so the second pulse B. So remember if I had zero photons in pulse A, then my atoms are all in state G. So this pulse B basically sees a perfectly reflecting mirror. But now with this kind of, uh, if I did have a photon in A, which is converted to a Rydberg excitation, uh, this photon B now basically sees a large hole in my array and wants to be transmitted. And it's clear that there should be an optimum to that. Um, so basically I can neither make my, my beam waves so small you know, that I don't get any reflection at all, um, nor can I make my beam waves so big that essentially my photon B uh, can't fit through the blockade radius through this hole created by the Rydberg blockade. So basically there should be an optimum on the beam waves W which depends on the blockade radius. So you can analyze the whole thing more carefully but maybe not so surprising in the end. The errors that you get again look exactly like the kinds of errors that you get in the reflection problem. Okay. So the error now as a function of uh, blockade radius is found to scale like blockade one over blockade radius to the fourth power. Um, and again, that's a huge improvement over the best known uh, scaling in a, in a disordered ensemble, which is one over blockade radius to the three halves power. Um, and again, even aside, you know, aside from kind of abstract scalings, what's kind of remarkable here is that even for kind of uh, moderate system sizes, 
and blockade radii. So if you can create a blockade radius that's just kind of five uh, 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 lattice constants big, in principle, that already gives you uh, an error that's kind of on the 1% level. Um, so as you say, so far, all this is really just kind of fundamental errors. This is the error that only comes because you send in a photon and it gets scattered into a direction that you don't want. So in 3D ensembles, that's really the kind of limiting uh, uh, error in practice at the moment. Um, but then you can also ask, well, if I really try to build an array, you know, of course, it's not going to be easy. And what are the other kind of technical errors that can pop up? Um, well, there's a few that one can think of. You know, uh, the atoms, you know, so far I just consider atoms as being perfectly pinned. I have a perfect array. But in real life, you know, atoms will be moving around. And that could even just come from quantum zero point motion. You know, atoms are very light objects. Um, when I create an array, I might not get 100% filling, although I can come pretty close these days. And then I, have, you know, I didn't really tell you about what conditions I need on laser power and so on to achieve this Rydberg dressing in the first place. But you know, if one analyzes a little bit more carefully, I think it's fair to say that each one of these errors individually can be on the 1% level. So you know, I think there really is a kind of you know, huge potential for improvement by doing quantum optics in arrays of atoms. Um, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll basically conclude. Um, so you know, just to conclude, uh, wave interference and multiple scattering of light are not included in standard uh, uh, theories on the quantum interactions between atoms and light. Um, you know, again, that, that was a, even a huge surprise for me. I didn't, I, I didn't know that actually until after I left graduate school. Um, and then, you know, it turns out that you can basically exploit it. So by using ordered arrays of atoms, uh, then you can, you know, turn on this kind of selective radiance effect. And I showed you how you can get a huge reduction of errors uh, for applications like quantum memories and photon-photon gates. Um, honestly, what I think is, you know, that probably there's uh, the potential for a polynomial or exponential improvement in error for every application involving atoms of light. And so the only reason I, you know, I kind of explain these two is that you know, these are two of the easiest ones to analyze because it's kind of one and two photon level effects. So many of the other applications that you might want to achieve, like spin squeezing, for example, are many body problems. And that means you have to really take that kind of out of the equilibrium dissipative spin model and learn how to solve it, or at least you know, even approximate it in the many body limit. So that's really a kind of open direction. Um, and then, you know, aside from applications, I just think it's interesting to, to think about, you know, if, if our kind of standard theories missed basic effects like wave interference, if I really were to take this spin model and think about it just for fundamental reasons, you know, could one identify new quantum many body phenomena or maybe find new insights into phenomena, which really require that combination of, of wave interference and multiple scattering to arrive at. So, so those, are, those, are, those are really more kind of questions. Uh, I don't really have the answers for those at the moment, or, or yeah, you know, I have very kind of minimal answers for those. But nonetheless, you know, I think, you know, hopefully I've convinced you that this is a kind of really interesting direction for, for future investigation. So thanks. Thank you so much, Derek. Ama <clears throat> amazing talk, very interesting work. Congratulations on that. Really, really interesting. It's Thank great you. to see. It's great to see such good science coming from your group. Um, I, 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 there is there is some technical thing I didn't understand, but uh, I'm sure you can clarify it very easily. So for the blockade effect, you need this um, classical light to switch to you know to 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 produce the AC star shift, right? And so wow. the idea the idea is that this is all, this classical light is always on, or is it synchronized with the arrival of each photon, or like? Uh, it's um, always... Yeah, so it's a, it's really just a global uh, control field that's always on. Always on. Okay. Yeah, and it, it, it doesn't it doesn't interfere with the quantum optics. I guess I, I didn't I should have made that more clear, but the, the classical control field is on this E to R transition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's always on, it's huge, it, it interacts with every single atom. But I see. Then the, the quantum optics is really on this G to E transition, which is a completely different wavelength. Right. So that's the transition where I'm sending in kind of single photons at a time or trying to produce non-classical light. So they're they're really just kind of separate transitions and they don't right. Mm -hmm. interfere with each other in any way. I see. Yeah. And then, okay, I cannot resist, I, I, I cannot resist the temptation to ask you about, um, so you, sh you showed about photon, photon gates with high fidelity, and then I cannot resist the temptation to ask you where you have really been working in the direction of 
like uh, proposing concrete applications for photonic quantum computing devices or things, or are you very far away from that yet? You're kind of like, how close are you guys to looking at the details of really like poss possible implementations of, of photon photon gates? Um, well, I think, uh, so I don't think we've analyzed it much more than what I presented today. So we have thought about, you know, basically, some of the technical details that are involved. So, so I did mention effects like, you know, if you have atomic motion or if you have imperfect filling, what happens? So, so that we have looked at in, in more detail. And, and there's, I guess there's a kind of archive paper that we have with all the kind of gory detail. But beyond that, we haven't thought so much uh, about it, honestly. And okay. it's maybe, maybe a combination of two reasons. So one is, you know, I think now, I mean, I think it's a it's a it's a really interesting direction to explore. You know, I hope the experiments go in that direction. Um, but I guess that's really kind of the next step. So um, you know, these are, these are these would kind of be like a new class of experiments. So I should you know, of course, people have the ability now to generate two D arrays. You know, like Emmanuel Bloch's experiment that I showed. Um, but I guess it's you know, the, those experiments historically were more for kind of quantum simulation or ultra cold atoms, right? And they don't really have the apparatus to, for quantum optics, for efficient quantum optics built in. Mm. So I think if one wants to go in this direction experimentally, one really has to kind of, you know, decide that from the beginning, you know, to basically have capabilities like a quantum gas microscope, but also have to have the kind of quantum optics capabilities built in. And, you know, I do think that if people did that seriously, people could reach, you know, this kind of, you know, let's say at least 90% fidelities in, in these photon-photon gates. All right. Uh, and then beyond that, you know, honestly, like we haven't thought so much about extending these results in particular, also because we're, we've been thinking about more like this kind of many body limit, you know, can we understand all this physics at the many body level and what's encoded in there, um, which is really to me a kind of like a huge kind of scientific challenge, you know, but, uh, so, so that's kind of what's occupied most of our time. In, in okay. fair, fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. Um, Rene, I can see you switch on your camera. Would you, yeah, yeah. Would, you would you like to delight us with some of your questions? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, so a very, very nice talk. talk. Hi, hi, Derek. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so my, what my first question was, you, you motivated um, you motivated your research with showing this experiment with the, um, with the optical depth, right? Where you find, hey, the large optical depth, you, you get some problems there because your atom wasn't perfect. And now, of course, in your model, it seems that you assumed a perfect atom, right? You said you have a two-state atom, but you, you explained us that in the other case, um, the issue was there were other electronic transitions and some populations got lost and stuff like this. So right. could, you, could you tell us, does, does, then, does then this, um, does then yeah, kind of your approach scale better under having these, the same, let's say, use the same atom as in this, as in this paper? Yeah, so, right, so we, we assumed, um, you know, a, a simple, well, three-level atom, which, of course, is in real life. Um, but I think the difference is that in these experiments, that non-three-level nature, you know, the, the 20 or 30-level atom that you have in real life, that only manifests itself at these kind of huge optical depths of, you know, 200 or more, which comes out to basically kind of like, I mean, probably like 100,000 atoms or so. So I guess the point is now when you go to these arrays, if you can already achieve this kind of 1% level errors in, in you know, five by five, seven by seven arrays, um, that's not nearly enough atoms. You know, so, so basically the, 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 op the optical depth coming from these off resonant transitions that you don't want, that's still extremely low. So, so that's why I think the, the technical error of off resonant transitions doesn't enter into our approach. Okay, perfect. That makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. And then I have another question about, um, about that maybe I missed this because as I understood this now such that you say hey the distance between my atoms has to be below the resonant wavelength for this to work for the scheme right um, and is this is this all or can can this be geometrically optimized can I choose a certain lattice configuration to make things more efficient given us let's say I have a fixed atom number what's the what's the optimum I can choose or it just doesn't matter just needs to be sub wavelength um, that's a good question. So I can't rule out that there's some clever geometry that you can use uh, with bigger wavelength. But 
uh, at least in the way that we envision the physics. So, you know, uh, based on this kind of Bragg diffraction and, and shutting off diffraction orders and so on, that really does require the lattice constant to be smaller than lambda. So, um, so that, I mean, for sure that does limit like how you can go about approaching this in an experiment. Um, so for example, these days there's these beautiful experiments with uh, tweezer arrays and, and Rydberg interactions, right, from Broways and Lucan. Yeah. So in that, in that case, those atoms are way too far apart for this to work. You know, the only system that we have now to achieve this kind of defect-free subway like lattice constant is this kind of mod insulating phase, which is this kind of huge kind of overhead cost, you know, if you want to build that experiment. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if it, there, there might be ways to kind of make life a little bit easier in the future, for example, maybe you can find some exotic atom where you have a quantum optics transition where the wavelength is actually quite long. And then some shorter, you know, some separate transition or the, with a short wavelength that you can use for trapping. Right. So then you can, you know, use I the, the that use, use that to your advantage because basically the, the requirement is you need to be sub wavelength on the quantum optics transition. So, so there might be some tricks you can play experimentally, but but yeah, it at least to at my level of understanding, it seems like you do need the sub wavelength uh, lattice constant on the quantum optics transition. Okay. Yeah. Super. And Andreas, I see you're raising your hand. Would yes, you like to ask yes. a question? Please go ahead. Uh, it's a very nice uh, talk um, at um, the beginning. And um, I would have uh, one question. Um, uh, did you think about um, two photon interaction or two photon gates uh, via this scheme? It's uh, maybe it's a, a similar question um, as. Uh, uh, as we had before uh, concerning quantum computing and so on. Um, I mean, so just to make sure I understand, uh, when you say two photon, so uh, what I presented I, was a gate between two single photon qubits. So for example, like a controlled uh, base gate. Okay. So are you thinking about like a, a gate that involves more photons than two or? Uh, wait, it's uh, it's not really a, a two photon gate. It, it's uh, um, when you make a, your quantum information in the state of multiple photons, uh, and these are two, um, then uh, um, you should shoot on uh, on your device with uh, the two photons, and um, and this actually should uh, be uh, the gate, and or, or is it is it this? I don't. I yeah. So uh, uh, right. So uh, I'll, I'll. I'm not completely sure. I understood your question, so I'll try to answer it, and then you can tell me if. Yeah. If, if somehow I'm still missing something. So, so what I've described here is uh, basically a, a photon photon controlled phase gate. So I have okay. single photon qubits, and then you know in the kind of quantum circuit you know picture, this would be like a controlled you know gate between those two photon qubits. And you know, then if I wanted to build a quantum computer, I would I would just need many more qubits, and then I would you know, want to design a some specific sequence of gates to apply it, and then that would be my kind of quantum you know circuit. So it, it's scalable in, in that sense. Um, but is that what you're asking? Uh, yeah, this was uh, what I'm asking actually. Yeah, yeah. So, so right. So, so because I only focused on the to me at the moment, building at the block of a single photon gate and its efficiency. Hmm. Um, but then, in principle, if you want to build a, a you know a more complex circuit, you would just you know need more photons, and you would apply these gates sequentially, right? Yeah, of okay, course. Then you, you. Th then you would run into problems of synchronization between different photons, right? But that's a different yeah. story, right? Right. Right, so, so I think to, to make that fully scalable, then you would need you know additional ingredients like you know quantum memories and so on. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. well, very interesting. Luigi, Luigi um, you also have your your yeah, raise in your hand. Yeah, would you yeah, like yeah, a yeah. please? Thanks, please, uh, thanks ahead. for the nice uh, talk. So I have a very small question. So um, it's actually it's on Rydberg um, uh, atoms. Um, so uh, basically, you can uh, say I summarize and I might be oversimplify. You make you can make a hole 
in your array because of the Coulomb blockade or the Coulomb, the Rydberg dipole, block, dipole blockade, okay, for the Rydberg blockade. Uh, but uh, I think I wonder whether you mm, uh, can uh, or would be interesting to tune the radius of this hole. So, do you think it's in interesting to do that? So, who, can that um, lead to interesting thing? I think so. So, I mean, if the goal is just to get a photon photon gate, I, I guess mm. not. Probably, you know, I, right? You just want the blockade radius to cover your entire system. But um, I think if one wanted to explore kind of many body physics with photons, yeah. I guess that kind of tunable Rydberg interaction would be a rich resource, right? Because somehow, you know, uh, that gives you kind of a, you know, so if, if atoms had kind of uh, an infinite range interaction, then there's not really any many body physics in there, it's just kind of trivial. Mm -hmm. But, you know, mm -hmm. if, if you imagine you play the same game in a kind of a 3D medium, and now photons were now these kind of hardcore extended objects that started interacting with each other. Uh, yeah, then, then I guess the kind of finite Rydberg blockade would be interesting, you know, mm -hmm. and, and would affect the, the properties of the, 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 the state of light coming out. Yeah, yeah. No, but because I think there is a kind of experimental technique and I think also some theory by Lesanovsky uh, is the, the theorist and the experimentalist is Oliver Mosch. Mm -hmm. And actually, they tune the dipole brocade using. Um, uh, in, uh, uh, they basically they make a the tuning that depends on the on the on the place uh, uh -huh. through an additional laser. So it's uh -huh. a kind of dissipative uh, engineering dissipation, and uh, because of uh, because of the TV specific interaction that you know very well of the Dribble interaction, actually this uh, uh, you can control the de excitation rate. And okay. uh, therefore, the, the 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 radius is can be adjusted, can be adjusted, and can be also controlled. Uh, I think it's um might be interesting in, in this uh, context. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it would be interesting. So I think if one had a knob to 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 tune the range of interaction uh, of mm -hmm. this affected photon photon interaction, but also to kind of tune whether it's uh, coherent or dissipative. I guess that would be a kind of fantastic knob for kind of many body physics with photons. Um, yes. You know, the, the bottleneck, at least in my own head, is more like I, I'm sure it's interesting, but then like I'm not sure how to solve it. So that's the challenge yeah. again of, of solving this kind of multiple scattering problem in the quantum domain and, and with many mm -hmm. photons. But but you know, it, it is something we're, we're seriously thinking about. You know, you know, yeah. figuring out how to how to do, and we have some basic insights. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I hope that in you know. You know, a couple of years, we we I can have a more kind of convincing answer to to tell you. Thank you, thank you. Right, um, Rene, is that another question? Yeah, right. one a crazy one maybe. All right, um, Go ahead, I was just please. I was just thinking. Okay, so I like I like cavities. Okay, and so of course I can now think there's this analog on you put an atom into a cavity and then there's a mirror image and a mirror image of the mirror image and you got a chain of atoms you got this array of atoms and now your atoms need to be sub wavelength spaced so taking a single atom putting in the cavity i would need a cavity with a length smaller than lambda over two which i think doesn't work or maybe it does i don't know have you are you also thinking in this direction i guess there's a, there must be some fundamental link right also between the density of states what the cavity is doing and this would be, can you comment on this? I would be very interested in this. Yeah, I mean, um, so I, I guess there, there's two maybe different or complementary ways to answer that. Um, so, right, so, so a real cavity, you know, uh, or you know, at least the ones that people use in quantum optics, the, the, uh, the, 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 the spacing between mirrors is much bigger than the wavelength. Yeah. And so, you know, of course, cavity QED is a well-established way to increase the atom photon interaction efficiency. You know, the, the cooperativity instead of optical depth shows up as the fund fundamental figure of merit. Mm -hmm. And in that case, you know, uh, I think it, it, would, it would be interesting to basically think of putting arrays into cavities. And then the idea was that then you can also shut off the emission into four pi. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, whereas okay. standard theory would say that, you know, your figure of merit is now n times the single atom cooperativity. I guess with this selective radiance, you could actually get a figure of merit that scales much faster as a function of n. Um, so there's, I guess, that, that kind of practical answer about, you know, 
uh, about the you know, increase in the figure of merit of cavity QED. But then you, you also mentioned this problem with kind of mirror images and so on. And, and I think that that is a valid way of thinking about the problem. So if I could create a, a cavity uh, whose lattice constant is sub-wavelength, mm -hmm. or, or sorry, who, whose mirror spacing is, mirror spacing, yeah. Yeah, is less than lambda or maybe lambda over two, then you know, I can think of the problem as not just the one emitting atom, but you know, kind of all its mirror images. And um, I think it's correct to say that, right, so if you make your, your cavity too short, and if your dipole is oriented in the correct direction, then it, you, it's known that you can shut off the spontaneous emission of an atom completely. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, okay. I think historically it's derived just really doing the brute force quantization of modes and so on. But I think an elegant way to reinterpret that result is in terms of the mirror images and the collective radiation and interference of all, of all those images. Cool. Um, so I can see Philip raising his hand, which makes me very happy to have questions from, from the students. That's great. I was going to cut it off, but let's go for a last question by Philip. It's, Please, go it's, ahead. It's just, it's just a short question. Thanks for, for the um, interesting talk. And I was wondering, how is this um, atom, atomic lattice normally implemented in, in real life? So is it normally on top of a crystal, or is it um, trapped? Or how do, does this um, show yeah. itself? Um, so um, again, at the moment, I, I think the only way to get the combination of sub-wavelength lattice constant and close to 100% filling of the lattice sites is through um, basically by using ultra-cold atoms and going through a so-called superfluid to mock insulator transition. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but basically the idea is um, you start with a, a degenerate bosonic gas of atoms. Um, and so basically you, you form this kind of so an optical lattice is basically you just send light in from different directions to create a, a scanning wave, uh, in this case, in two dimensions. And then, you know, because it's a standing wave of light, the lattice constant is naturally lambda over two. So you get the lattice constant, the, the sub-wavelength lattice constant for free. And then the challenge is then is to really, how do you fill that with, you know, kind of 100% filling, like with really just one atom per site. And for that, they use this so-called uh, superfluid to mod insulator transition, which basically says that if you start with a lattice kind of very low, then your atoms are in a quantum phase called a superfluid state, um, where you know, essentially the, you know, the number of atoms in each side is just kind of random. But then if you kind of then ramp up the, the lattice slowly, you can undergo this kind of transition to a so-called mod insulating state where um, essentially you have this competition, like if two atoms sit on the same site, they have this kind of extra energy cost to do so. And so um, in this phase transition, basically, you know, if you tune up slowly, then you can kind of, you, through this kind of uh, extra energy cost, you can actually suppress the problem. You can suppress um, having events where two atoms sit on the same site. And then you wind up, you know, at least in some region of, of your system with exactly one atom per site, at, at least at zero temperature. Um, so, so, so it's a complicated process by which they get this kind of, you know, 2D lattice in the first place. Um, yeah, but it's but, not something that you can easily implement and just shoot atoms on a, on a crystal or something that has, you have to have a certain... Yeah, so, so uh, uh, yeah, I think that's kind of one of the questions going forward, like, you know, the, those mod insulating experiments, they work perfectly well for ultra-cold atoms and what they've wanted to do historically. Um, but then if one wants to do quantum optics with these experiments, that they're very slow to create that type of configuration just once could be, you know, it could take you tens of seconds. So you can do one experiment every tens of seconds, you know, and, and I don't think that's really fast enough to do serious quantum optics. So yeah, it's a question of, you know, experimentally, if you want to do quantum optics, is there a faster way to, and a more robust way to build up uh, that type of defect free lattice? Yeah.